Welcome to our podcast today, Sunday, December 2nd. My name is John, and across the table, I have (laughs) Cal. And uh, we're going to be discussing Mark Hamill's recent comments. And uh, I think that uh, you have a a strong idea, but we, for the viewers out there, we'll just say, Mark Hamill's quoted recently as saying, um, quote, for centuries, men have had their chance to rule government with middling to poor results. Who's ready to let women take charge completely? Just women. I know I am. I know I am. <laughs> the soy is very strong with this one. <laughs> <laughs> so this is his comments in regards to a photo titled, Welcome to the 116th Congress. And uh, it shows six women who yeah. have recently been been admitted into the halls of power. Right. And that's how he kind of bases this off, like what's between their legs, right? Hey, they're women. And some people will say that um, if the view of a sex being superior to another is considered sexist, right? So, uh, but you know, I'm not surprised because I believe Mark Hamill is also anti-gun. Is that correct? He always cites the acceptable opinion on every issue. Yeah, right. (laughs) (laughs) If that uh, sword that was waving, the Jedi sword, uh, lightsaber was a gun, you know, probably think differently, right? (laughs) Um, And there was that, that scene in Star Wars, where he did hold that lightsaber and pointed to his face, and kind of, you know, in a minute it could have, like, you know, lasered off his face. Right. Right. So I think right. that's another instance of yeah, very, not very good uh, trigger control. You might right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> trigger safety. Yeah. He's um yeah he 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 always seems to be on the right side of the issues. Anytime if you look him up, all you have to do is look up uh, Mark Hamill political positions, and you'll uh, for for the type of actor that he is. It's it's interesting to hear that he always seems to be on the uh, correct side as right. far as the uh, allowable side. It's kind of like uh, George T- Takaki. What did you say? Did you say his last name? Uh, yeah, yeah. I know. Well, well yeah. <clears throat> but he, he usually does the same thing. Um, but recently he made um, a tweet or something about saying, hey, you know, this immigration thing going across the border, apparently uh, the tear gassing has been going under also Obama's time. And this isn't just a Trump's issue. This is a, he's, he will say it's an American issue, right? right? So it's interesting of him to kind of correct himself. But I don't think uh, this is something that Mark Hamill will ever kind of go towards correcting himself. Um, right. You could say like someone who kind of forgot that. And even in his own movie, letting a woman have, uh, not like letting a woman, but like the woman there that wasn't in control after Leia uh, just, you know, led to the destruction of the rebellion. You could say, right? Because <laughs> when they were going into the Millennium Falcon, there's only like 10 people left, right? When they're kind of waiting, maybe there's a signal that people are going to come out there and save them. Nobody did, right? Um, right. And all because uh, C thought that Poe was mansplaining or <laughs> being a place out of position or something like that. Right. He, she, she, uh, was it uh, Holdo? Admiral Holdo? Yeah. She crashes the ship, which in itself is kind of uh, right. insult <laughs> to. Um, the driving skills of you know, but you so you hear you see things like this, and you're it is an odd movie franchise to hold up as the epitome of like well, putting women into power has only been good, or right. you know, and if you're opposed to putting anybody into power, you see that and you say, well, certainly it's not going to work out any better if you right. just choose women. <laughs> so he wants all congressmen to be women, and I was like, you know what, why stop there? Why don't I just replace all soldiers with women? You know, notwithstanding, hey, it's uh, socialized uh, military. Not to say, like, yeah, you know, women still learn how to shoot guns. I think that's very important. But when you look at uh, even the military, like the Navy, uh, you find that uh, they tend to get pregnant when they have overseas missions, right? right? And so that's very costly in terms of having to send them back to stateside, find a different job for them, retrain someone else, and send them back overseas, right? Uh, and that's rampant in, in the Navy. Um, so it's kind of weird, I guess, you know, what, what other areas do you want to put women in in charge? But, you know, we want to say that, well, if you put women in charge, there won't be any war. You kind of forget about, uh, like, um, the White Feather campaign. Have you ever heard of that? Uh, I do, I believe, but you need to refresh my memory on that. So in World War uh, One, I think, uh, so, like, the, they talk about waves of feminism. They always say, like, well, you know, the different waves are different from one another. Mm-hmm. And so now they, all, they kind of have the same kind of... Um, common denominator of hating men and that in the first world war during the white feather campaign when people where there were men still left behind in britain and england were not in the front line in the trenches getting slaughtered 
being used as a cannon fodder, disposable males, as it were, uh, they will shame them if there are any men left behind and give them a white feather. Uh, I think there's a whole movie that came out uh, not that long ago hmm. about the white feather campaign, like suffragette feminists coming out there shaming men yeah. for, for not dying for them. Uh, and there was this article that I came across that showed uh, like a 14 year boy that was given a, a white feather and that shame, uh, I guess it's drove, drove him, like the, the societal shame placed on him um, and making him feel guilty, drove him to suicide, hung himself. Right. Yeah. You see, you know, we've discussed recently, of course, uh, the hundred years uh, since the end of World War One, and so that's a that's a timely issue when you think about the way we still look at who's expendable, right? And we think, you know, so th- in a sense, um, there there are more and more people talking about sending sending women into into zones of combat, and still the deep gut of most people says that it's it's uh, doesn't sit well, and it's, it is odd because if you look at women that way, you also would look at men. You would think, well, why why are men so much more expendable? You know, why do we have this ingrained thing in our culture that says this? All right. Um, it, and you know, in, in movies too, you you see that as well. But it, it's a point that do, does get glossed over. And then the, those women who handed out the uh, the feathers, you have to wonder what you know what kind of equality were they hoping for? Right. Yeah. So, Maybe it's a cultural thing. Um, and like you know, the placement of you women in Western societies, um, they don't want them on the front lines. Uh, and they kind of look at all this stuff, you know, men are stronger biologically, right? Um, I think my friend Luke brought up a point that, you know, it takes um, 10 times longer for a woman to build up the same kind of muscle as a man uh, can build up. Um, so there's different advantages, like the PT stuff is kind of different as well in the military. Right. Um, so, you know, if, if the goal of the organization is like, violent defense or violent offense right you want the most violent people capable of violence there right um and i think uh it, it goes to show time and time again that men are better capable at violence right yeah i mean the crime statistics bear that out yeah well. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the prisons are heavily populated with men and right and not so much uh women <laughs> right women do get uh about a third off the prison sentence uh than men Right. Uh, you know, some of them want to say like areas in which women dominate. Yeah. Uh, today, right now, and he said, "Well, you know, let women dominate Congress is what Mark Hamill wants." But you know, today they kind of dominate uh, in less prison sentence for the same crime. Right. Uh, so, but you look at uh, in terms of the culture values, I think in Western society, in which they don't want to place women out there in the front lines or leaving to be combatants. Um, but you look at like the refugee waves coming from these Middle Eastern countries, leaving behind women right. to be these combatants themselves uh, kind of speaks ill of their place and value, I think, of women in those particular regions. Right. That's a good point. You know, you think about fatherhood and the, uh, the goal of any father being there to provide and uh, be there for his family. And so you think, you know, these guys who are um, heading for the U.S. border from Honduras, you wonder why... Are they? Um, why is there no discussion of that? Yeah, you know, it's sort of a selective discussion that goes on. Western culture vital will, have, will be like in that Titanic scene, where it's like women and children first, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, talk about male privilege there. As long as you, you have a, as long as you have a child, right? right. <laughs> it's like that guy in Titanic. Right. I have a kid, huh, a child. Oh well, you know that's your. You and know, he your just task. chucks the kid off, yeah. off the boat after that. He's like, I'm done with you. I don't need you. All right. Where's that uh, Diamond of the Sea or whatever it was called? It's been a while since I've seen Titanic, so uh, don't fault me for that. <laughs> yeah, Diamond of the Sea, something like that. Um, yeah, so the, um, you know, you mentioned a couple of statistics uh, recently where there, is, there are women in charge or men in charge, and in this case, it's women in charge of other places, uh, such as public schools, that you referenced, uh, divorce courts. 76% of all public school teachers are women. That's right. a lot, right? Most of my teachers right. growing up are women. I think only had one, two, two male t-shirts. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, it, throughout all of your public schooling. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I uh, I was fortunate enough from a young age to, for whatever reason, to get more of an equal equal share. So I had like a fourth or fifth grade t- teachers who were men, and it was pretty refreshing because. They would just like lift weights in front of the class and do like cool things, and you're just like, "Wow, that's cool. That's like you know masculinity." Yeah. And, uh, 
you know, for the boys who never get, who might not even have a father at home, it really did, uh, I thought, you know, it might help. So, uh, but, you you know, so you mentioned divorce courts. Uh, single women make more money than men under. Uh, like around, uh, under, 30s. around under 30s, yeah. Uh, so there's areas in which they do dominate. Uh, they dominate in getting more degrees, right? Graduation rates, uh, right. especially high school graduation rates. So you find uh, that there is a higher um, rate of males dropping out of high school than females. And that's because, you know, your teachers are all females. This is a female-dominated area, right? Control and charged by women. Uh, that uh, boys are not really going to do that well. They're going to be treated as if they were girls, right, right in these kind of environments. Um, and you find that maybe in the result of, um, I believe there's like a dozen states that still have um, uh, corporal punishment. And will, they'll beat up your kid, your boy. Right. Yeah, teachers, school officials will beat up your kid. And overwhelmingly, you can look, it's like in the 90%, what is the ratio of female to males, boys and girls, who gets, who gets uh, the brunt end of that stick? Yeah, it's boys. Right. Naturally, boys are are going are precocious, and uh, they're going to yeah. be accused of having ADD <laughs> or something. Right. And that's why they're they're out of control. You sit down, you read Romeo and Juliet. Right. <laughs> Don't read Treasure Island. Right. Schooling really is. It seems like it's always been designed, or at least more recently, for kids who are capable of sitting still and behaving. And that's you know, like if you're anybody, if you know anybody who's thinking about having kids, they're like, man, I really hope um, we have girls. <laughs> So I don't have to worry about boys running, jumping out the window and doing, but that's what you expect out of boys too. And I think there's, there's a lot of, you know, positive sides to that right. behavior. That, uh, and they've done like studies, even like on monkeys, like female um, boy monkeys and the boy monkeys just kind of want to go to the cars and stuff like that. And the female monkeys are like the little dolls and have that kind of internal maternal instincts kind of kicks in. Right. Right. So it's kind of hardwires, but it's biological. Right. Um, and I think uh, they should be taught differently right i mean there's an area where you can have your your mix up it's not to say like oh my god for like uh i think it's only four hours really that they have any schooling right uh like you have the rest of the day to do like a uh co-ed education afterwards or something like that right right um and that's another topic for another thing public schools want to go over another time right right that's rife with uh well it's all yeah there's so many other issues too involved with that but uh in with public schools but yeah, there, there's, to, to, I guess to draw it back to Mark Hamill and his comments, you, you just question why is this the, the, why is this not something that doesn't get more criticism for him to say? Why right, it, yeah. <laughs> why does that seem just like, oh, what a courageous individual that Mark Hamill is. He makes it seem, again, as if uh, these are the first politicians ever elected, right? Because, uh, of course, it's very easy for them to ignore uh, conservative ones who are in uh, the House or congresswoman as well uh, and there's a list there's uh Jeanette Rankin you know the first woman elected to US Congress was Republican right, right. there was a uh, Shelley Capito from West Virginia Susan Collins from Maine uh, Mia Love from Utah mm -hmm. right and so it's it's interesting like you know it's very easy for them to kind of forget you know they want to say that these are achievements but you know these these already have been done it's not like the first time right um, and what happens to those women when they do get into office they're criticized vehemently by yeah. The same people who praise Mark Hamill for his claims. So you wonder, it's not that they necessarily, maybe they don't want women per se, but they want their 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 particular women. That Forced equality them. sort of in there, yeah. Um, I think though with, uh, what's her name, Car Carlita, Car what's, what's her last name? The, uh, the one from New York, uh, Horseface. Oh yeah, yeah, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. <clears throat> I wanna say that, uh, uh, the, the first memes that came out were great. And I was thinking, okay, great, that's fine. But she just won't show up. And so there's there's going to be an endless amount of like meme farming, I think, for her tenure. Because uh, like, so on the Liberate page, I posted a couple memes up there. But like, she just keeps doing wild things, saying wild things. Like, you know, what's, uh, she talks about like, you know, there's the, uh, the House, uh, the White House uh, and, and the Senate. And it's like, uh, and she tried to correct herself, something to affect her saying like, you know, the, the three chambers of Congress, right? Um, <laughs> like this is Hogwarts or something. And uh, so I think there's, from her particularly, there's gonna be a wealth of a lot of fun memes that'll come out shortly. Yeah, yeah, she's she didn't really know what she was doing. I think she's also got her phone out all the time and she's doing this uh, these chats where she's eating mac and cheese and um, just, just meandering about various issues. And so you, 
it's fascinating. She talked about uh, health insurance and how it's cheaper now that she's working. She's in Congress as opposed to when she was a waitress. And, yeah. and um, there's so many, it, the discussion needs to happen where uh, somebody who believes in markets can jump in and say, there's a reason for that. And there's a reason that waitresses, you know, and it's more expensive for waitresses, but uh, they don't want to have, you know, it's always, it's always more government spending. It's right. going to be the solution for why <laughs> it needs to be fixed. Uh, I did hear that they're going to remove the um, forced fine feature. I think next year or something like that, where you're forced to have uh, health insurance. Um, but I have had friends who cried when I came in, kicked in, and they mm-hmm. looked at their their paycheck and they looked like how much like it doubled for them. Right? I mean, these are people working like coffee shops. Yeah, uh, it's like young people. Right? These are not like uh, like oh you know yeah like like uh, George Bush Senior. You know like in, in a chair needing that kind of help. Right. Um, yeah, so I could see, uh, well, I mean, I can see it. They can see it. Maybe she can't, you know, she can't even see her own uh, bank account to see, like, she has money, right? I think there's, like, an inquiry that says she has, like, ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000. Like, she has money to land an apartment, at least, um, or share a room, right? Right. Uh, in the D.C. area. Oh, yeah, the uh, assumption that you should not have to rough it a little bit right. in your yeah. 20s yeah. and even 30s is, is kind of funny there. There, I read one article one time. This girl had moved to San Francisco, and she wanted to be able to live in a one-bedroom, and she ended up spending like three thousand dollars a month, and it was pretty much her entire paycheck. Yeah. Right. And it was like and the you know the question there was, why didn't you just find a bunch of roommates and rough it for a while and get your foot in the door somewhere and do all these things that you have to do, that you don't like doing, but it, it is what it is. And um, yeah, you know that part doesn't get discussed. <laughs> I read something about there are a couple uh, people in Congress who have turned their office into their sleeping bunks, pretty much. Right. Uh, and there's like some reporter that, that catches them all the time and kind of puts it out there. It's like, hey, where are you going? He's like, you know, he's going back to his office after going to uh, to the gym. Uh, they kind of pull out a cot and kind of sleep in there. Uh, because these are people who whose home states are kind of ways away. Um, and even not so far away, according to Google, who says that Elijah Cummings sleeps in his office, but he might just sleep in his office because uh, he just likes to take naps. Yeah, <laughs> you know, he's, he's getting old. But, Didn't uh, Biden take like uh, the train? I think like every day or something like that to Congress. There's people here in um, living in Richmond uh, who carpool all the way down uh, to DC every day, right, Monday to Friday. I think that's wild. Right. I know people who live in Philadelphia who do that, right? So like. Finding a place that's cheap isn't sort of be that difficult. Um, you know, if not, you know, you just pay for it, right? Right. Yeah. How, right. how, how are you going to find uh, money for this? You just pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> that's that, according to Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, who says that if you need to pay for health care, you just pay for it. You just pay for it. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. find the money somewhere. That's just wild. <laughs> so there's um, other women in charge in history. I think are interesting. There's a list uh, that we have we're going to go over. Um, as if to say, because he's saying like this is like the first time in a way that he's kind of approaching right. this, right? You right. know, so, uh, Margaret Thatcher, Thatcher, who's famous for saying the problem with socialism is you eventually run out of other people's money. Uh, someone who, of course, the, the left abhorred, uh, so it was anti labor, uh, labor unions. And so you can say anti leftist for the most part. Um, but a lot of the policies you kind of put into place are the ones that the current establishment in England are kind of able to expand in. Uh, kind of like Reagan, uh, most of like uh, the things he wants to kind of put in place has never kind of really happened. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, Margaret Thatcher, you know, there's uh, Queen Elizabeth I. Right, yeah. right. I mean, and when you look at someone like that, she basically uh, was, you know, the entire government. Yeah. <laughs> um, so in a way that you could say that it was run by all women because it was just her. It was her. Her sister, who was the first monarch, was Bloody Mary. Right. And there's a reason why they call her Bloody Mary. <laughs> yeah. She would uh, put to the stake and burn alive uh, people who opposed her. Right. Um, these religious wars that went on in there. Uh, and then, of course, you have your Merkel from Germany. And I think uh, the funniest thing with her was because, you know, Germany leaves the EU and they were threatening Poland for not, you know, fulfilling their quotas for refugees. Right. Uh, and taking in uh, a group of people who abhor Western culture, um, and having the same problems that they're having, and they said, "Well, we're gonna, we're gonna have to sue you. We're gonna have to find you." And I think it's great that the 
Polish foreign minister came out saying, well, sure, you, you go ahead and figure those numbers out. I think uh, you owe us at least a trillion dollars in World War II reparations. And uh, maybe we'll take it out of that. Right. Yeah. Leave it to the polls to <laughs> to bring it back that Trump card. Right. <laughs> of uh, constant abuse from Germany over the past hundred years. <laughs> I think in um, the people that might save Europe might be the wing hussars, as they did at the Battle of Vienna, hmm. and kind of save Europe. Come back. It'll, it'll be down to the wing hussars again <laughs> to kind of save Europe uh, from this invasion. Right. And uh, bring things back to uh, how they were. Yeah, there's there's um, you know there's a couple countries that aren't going quietly into that good night when you look at uh, the way that people are and you know it's becoming almost popular because as soon as you hear somebody like Hillary Clinton say that uh, well maybe they should tamp down the number of migrants uh, Hillary Clinton another influential woman in power uh, so uh, <laughs> yeah wow yeah ignore that so an interesting comment I do not have honest. evidence against her. <laughs> Yes, I am not suicidal. I don't want to kill myself, <laughs> please. <laughs> um, so there, there's, you know, and she's an influential woman who may very well um, try to take another stab at, at Trump, too. You never know. But, um, yeah, as far as the, the, and also Hungary is a country that doesn't seem to be too excited right. about, about that situation. And um, you can't blame them because they had been, you know, Hungary, especially, and Poland have been invaded so many times right, right. by other countries, other ethnic groups in, in history. They just say, this is no different. We know what invasion looks like. so They know what cultural <laughs> clashes look like. Right. Yeah. Um, especially Poland. I think there's like this, uh, there's this annual celebration of their own people, like Poland Day. Right. And people have these flags as like anti-Nazi symbol, anti-communist uh, symbol, the swastika and, and the hammer and the sickle. Right. I think that's awesome. I think that's great. Um, I think they're in a unique place versus other countries uh, to say no to both. Right. Um, Hungary is interesting because that gives birth to another ruler, uh, I guess, a position of, of rulership, Elizabeth Bathory. Who was purportedly uh, put to death over like 600 people, a lot of noble women, a lot of peasants. She's, she was a famous serial killer, right? A serial killer, right. So there's like a, a vampire lore <laughs> around her because she sought their blood to bathe in it, thinking it's a way for the, her to have uh, rejuvenation, to stay young forever. And so she will hang them up in cages and have her men just poke at them and stab Ooh. them. Yeah. And then she will just cover herself in their blood. Wow. Yeah. But she's a woman, you know, so... I guess it'll be all yeah. right. You know? Yeah, <laughs> right. It's this uh, in our culture. We still, I think, struggle under this sort of uh, system where women can do no wrong and men are are uh, the ones who engage in all the bad, the evil of right. society. And um, that it's a day, especially when you have a woman capable of controlling uh, troops and like Hillary Clinton. I think there, there was no doubt that she probably opposed a little little more or supported a little more um, violence in other countries so you you could say you know she gives off maybe this this uh, I'm going to be more diplomatic but maybe doesn't you know um, who knows but I heard yeah. she came under fire right at that airport you know, she's she's trialed and uh, combat ready and tested right <laughs> she's had bullets whizzing right by her head all right yeah absolutely. so there's <laughs> there's no one I trust to be able to press that button more than Hillary Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the last person on the list, Mao's wife, Jian Qing, I believe that's how you say her name. The right. Madame of China, right? She's interesting. Uh, she, when she got in control, I mean, she did the Cultural Revolution. She had a slogan of like destroying culture. Like the people destroying statues today, you know, she'd be her, their god because that's exactly what she did in China. I just destroyed. China's past everything uh, that had to do with uh, Marcus destroyed anything that had to do with capitalism destroyed and they went after business owners teachers and just uh, many of them just disappeared right she had her red guards uh, kidnap anyone who opposed her uh, critics when she used to be uh, in drama and, and doing acting sort of stuff uh, they would disappear as well uh, interesting though she would also make disappear and murder uh, her former lovers to kind of create a new uh, textbook history in which she was always with Mao, you could say, I think. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Ruthless Lady. She was part of the Gang of Four, and she was eventually put on trial for, I guess, turning China backwards. 
uh, after Mao's death. Oh, yeah. Hmm. So, I but she com- she committed suicide though. She so wasn't going to let them have a uh, right. Yeah, satisfaction. Say. Right. It, you know, those stories always they are so funny. Uh, they remind you of, you know, Kim Jong Un or Kim Jong Il was born on the top of a mountain, you know, and a rainbow appeared in the sky, and you know, it, like the the state, the governments of those countries just um, create these stories about these guys, and it's so fanciful and, and untrue. I mean, there's there's songs about Lenin where they talk about, oh, he's always with us. It's like a hymn from the USSR, and you know. It, it's no surprise that that of course she also they, they had to change the textbooks to make her right. seem seem like she was uh she was a okay okay person but uh like yeah. she was a virgin before he met her um <laughs> right i mean him alone mal i mean it's like his like former doctor physician escaped and published this book about like uh the weird stuff he encountered with mal mal would have like these uh slumber parties of like teenagers um and he passed, you know, he said, well, you know, this guy's uh, strong for women's rights, uh, but he'd give them syphilis, he'd give them STDs. Um, so, you know, there's there's a lot of yeah. stuff out there that, you know, I guess people in China, I, I don't know if they can hear about it now. I don't know um, what the situation, I guess they can still talk about it. I don't know if or, Google will allow them to hear Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or Facebook will allow them to see uh, this page or anything like that, or our content. Uh, yeah, yeah. There's, uh, it, it's sort of a, they have to go through this whole uh, process of, of dominating people's minds in order to get them to believe these things. Um, it's too bad. Um, I, I often wonder about, you know, will that continue in Hong Kong too? I know that I, you know, I, I've met people from Hong Kong and they can see the changes slowly happening too. I mean, in real time today, certainly we saw those things happen in China a long time ago, but uh, more and more China's trying to take over Hong Kong and, and get them to, uh, all right, that's gonna be wild. Right. Uh, I guess when I don't know when that is supposed to take place, like in ten years or something like that. So the, yeah, the handover happened in like nineteen ninety seven, and yeah. then um, they were given another, I believe, like fifty years of separate systems, one country mm-hmm. or something like that. So it'll be interesting to see in our lifetimes how much people in Hong Kong are brought under the wing and you know, right. forced to forced to believe that stuff. I think they're like starting to build a bridge to connect to Hong Kong, uh, and trying to have this like reassimilation thing kind of going on. Um, and Hong Kong is interesting because it's always like number one on the World uh, Economic Index uh, report. Right. Right. Um, and so, which is interesting because I have um, some people say like, why is Hong Kong number one? Is it um, they're, they're I guess relaxed on regulatory controls, socialist policies, you can say, but they were under Western influence when the British came over, right? And so I think like Asians are really quick to adopt like good methods, I guess, if when, when they want to, right? Right. Uh, like the Japanese were quick to like adopt uh, during the industrial age for them. Like um, when you have these US ships coming to port, it's like, no, you're gonna open up for trade. It's like, this is <laughs> ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, we're gonna have to adopt or, or fail. Uh, and right. within a few generations, they became uh, threatening on par with the US. Um, right. And so Hong Kong seems to be very quick to adapt as well uh, with Western values and see themselves ranking number one. Because there were at one point, it's like an island of sweatshops and now there's nothing but skyscrapers. Right. So it's, right. I always like to point at them because when people say, what about, uh, what if you have no natural resources, right? And you're going to go invade another neighbor who doesn't have any, who have what you want. It's like, well, you look at Hong Kong, is this an island, right? What do they have? It's not like they have mountains of gold or silver or anything like that. Right. It's uh, their trade policies, um, the cultural values that they have, uh, the free markets. And that bridge that you mentioned, it's a, um, I read a little bit into that. It, there was, it, it's like a toll bridge and you have to get a permit to get on it, onto it hmm. because it does connect, I believe it connects uh, Hong Kong to the mainland and Hong Kong to Ma- Macau. And so it's a symbol more than anything that, China is moving in on Hong Kong right. and um, connecting them and bringing them in. And uh, so, but it, it was funny reading about all the regulations you had to get through in order to get onto that bridge. It reminds you of, uh, you know, your easy pass lanes and, and different things around here that are really just another form of, of taxes, but people grin and bear it. I mean, I remember you mentioned people commute from Richmond into DC right. and from Philly. 
And I used to be one of those people. And it's so funny because, yes, you do the math and you say, uh, if this is only like once a week, I can do it. I can hack it. It's fine. But you you begin to, uh, you know, dread those types of commutes, yeah. especially if you have to do it every day. And then you have a low quality of life. And so thankfully, we're not, all, you know, we all have the freedom to move to another job <laughs> yeah. if we want. <laughs> so... Some people say that uh, this sort of stuff will help open China's markets. Um, maybe it, maybe it, maybe that's what it is. Maybe that's why their standard of like living has gone up. Um, I guess you could say maybe this might be a long-term pattern. Maybe inevitably they'll continue to open more and more of their markets, or they'll find a way to, to mess it up again, right? But you know, if if they can talk about it, because I don't think they can talk about like their past. I think that's still kind of taboo. Uh, I met this like, a supermodel, I think from Canada, it's Chinese, has family out there. She talks about how uh, they're, they're still not allowed to talk about it, right? Um, and they'll still, uh, you know, people still disappear in there, right? So it's a weird mix of them saying, yeah, you know, capitalism is kind of good, it kind of helps us, uh, but it could also kind of still fund uh, their machines of control, right? Now they have this ID check where they will scan for you and see if you have a good uh love for government points or something like that right yeah um so it's kind of like the uh the things that the markets creates a lot of people often think like that's going to free us from government but the government ends up generally using it against its own people in china the Com communist party's latest unlikely target young marxists from npr that's wild right <laughs> <laughs> right it's along those lines you know these are supposed to be the true believers and right they, even they are getting disappeared right in 2018 you wonder why um are don't they support the communist system and they're inconvenient for those in power right right so it doesn't matter what you really believe ultimately if you're if you're not going along with what the people in power want all right and i guess wrapping this up back towards uh the women thing right uh there's this one guy this communist guy trying to make like, this uh point about how uh, gay rights, well, you know, I'll talk about gay rights in uh, USSR, right? They hampered down against that. It's like, well, you know, Lenin was an advocate and it has some eco rights, as if to say, like, he was trying to make it say, like, this is the first time this ever happened. It's like, well, you can go back to uh, Greece and it was perfectly fine, right? Uh, you go to uh, Athens, they write about this stuff all the time. You find basis of this sort of stuff. Alexander the Great, right? <laughs> right? Uh, yes. At Flintstone Man. But when you look at um, the situation with women, they're trying to make it seem like this is the first time women's ever had. Uh, property rights. There's the first time there's been some kind of um, appreciation of women towards that regards and legal rules. But Sparta also had uh, rules in place in which, like, if the husband were to die, his property went to the wife. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it came to a point where mm -hmm. if anyone wanted to borrow money, uh, especially the, the, the government, they would borrow it from these rich uh, women. Right. 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 So yeah. <laughs> so and, and they held a lot of sway, political sway, in that. In that regards, uh, so they became like dominated by a matriarchy in a way, rich ones, uh, and so that that was how it was inscribed uh, in Sparta in that civilization, and that was uh, what, two, what, over a thousand years ago, right? So it's not like um, like it's a unique thing in this place of history. Uh, Western civilization has always had this interesting uh, dance with this kind of equality. Um, so it's uh, Mark Hamill, so I guess digression of it uh putting back into it i think it's kind of immature it's um it's like one of those virtuous suddenly potatoes i would say you know kind of trying to go out there so i'm one of the good guys mm -hmm. uh just like george takaki sometimes generally <laughs> tend to say i like mostly james wood's twitters uh <laughs> he's he has a gold no, mine yes. yeah yeah he has no filter right. right uh and i like how twitter tried at one point to shut him down and only if he would delete his previous text or something like that and he wouldn't so it's like oh, it's right. james, yeah james wood so <laughs> Well, let him do what he wants. Right, right. There's a uh, yeah. The, he's a he's an interesting figure. He for some reason he could have gone one of two ways, you know, with his career because uh, he plays that lousy bum in Casino. Yeah. And yet uh, he, for some reason now, is just like this this uh, paragon on Twitter who says the truth that no one will say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> of all people, you know. No, he's great. <laughs> um. Let's see what I can find here real quickly. Right. Um, so here's a picture with uh, Hillary Clinton with uh, Weinstein, Weinstein. And he says, there's an old Mexican proverb that says, tell me who you walk 
<laughs> with whom you walk, and I'll tell you who you are. <laughs> Hillary. Right. With Weinstein. Uh, so, yeah, this guy has no chill. Uh, <laughs> I think he's great. He's a treasure. Right. He Yeah, he hates the Clintons, and uh, he pulls no punches on them. And, you yeah, it is it is an interesting point, too, relating it back to um, – to women's issues and things like that, because to look at somebody like Weinstein and to look and to look at the people that you know Hillary surrounded herself with, and how she treated other women in the process, you think that you know she's no better for women than any any man, right? Know? And so, why would she necessarily be a good person to have in the power? Um, it's kind of arbitrary, All right? <laughs> and I've, and that's not to say like I know we're harping down a lot of, on women. I've, I've met a lot of great women. <laughs> <laughs> Very influential uh, to my philosophy and upbringing, and I will right. say um, women have been a major influence on that for me, um, more so than males in my life. Um, but at the same time, when I look at women in charge in my life, uh, they're the most uh, abusive. So I find it to be not just like in school, but childhood upbringing and everything, kind of growing up. So it's it's interesting. I think it's. Um, they make it seem like it's just men can be cruel uh, and mean and vicious, but sure. women also have that capacity. I mean, you look at the statistics uh, as well, uh, non-reciprocal intimate partner violence. This is a Harvard study. Uh, when violence is one-sided and domestic abuse, both women and men said that women were perpetrators about 70% of the time, right? Uh, and that's part of our culture thing. Our culture thing is like, don't hit back, right? Women, right? And you show, you show these uh, videos where uh, a woman's getting hit by her husband or something like that. People come to to her aid. If it's the reverse, you know, it's like everybody yeah. just laughs. Everybody laughs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just walks away. Right. Uh, you don't see any of that. Uh, in terms of uh, abusing children, mothers are twice as likely as fathers to abuse their biological children. Uh, this is like the Department of Justice. You know, these are people they kind of bring in for these kind of crimes. Uh, in other places, they find like mothers account for no less than fifty five percent of all child murders. Uh, mothers are 1.3 times more likely to abuse their children than biological fathers. And I think maybe some of this might be just to compensate that they're not phys as physically uh, dominating as, as men can be, so they feel like they have to kind of compensate compensate for that. Uh, and other ways to be, to have their parents a, a, a capacity of cruelty. And I think that's maybe where they come in. Um, so yeah, it's not, uh, no, not all women are saints. I th it, you know, it can be a, maybe perhaps a sim symptom of the fact that a lot of families are missing a father. And so I remember growing up without even having to think about getting, you know, like uh, punished or disciplined by your dad. You definitely when dad came home, it was like, OK, there's like two of them now. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm definitely not going to I'm definitely not going to mess up. And uh, so we, when you think about if you're not worried about dad coming home at the end of the day, I, I often think that can be uh that can be negative for a kid, and he might push the boundaries even, or he or she might push the boundaries even further than, um, than you know, if there's just mom present. But uh, single parenthood is a uh, big negative. Uh, right. They find um, so mom might be inclined. Oh, it's just me. I've got to do double duty, and right. so I, you know, I'm gonna hit this kid to make them, you know. But they never say that's well. a good excuse for uh, for husbands to be their wives. Like you know, it's like you know, it's. <laughs> I got a lot of stuff going on. It's just me. I'm working two jobs. You know, I just need peace and quiet, right? And if you switch the names for a child, right. for um, for mom, you know, for a wife, you know, you don't have you don't that excuse doesn't pass for for the father, right? Right. People don't even give that any slack. So absolutely, not. I don't think yeah. there's anything uh, a child can do that's considered bad or wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, they have no moral agency, right, to begin with. So that absolves them of having. Um, as a capability of doing evil, right? They say, well, you're a bad kid. Nah, there's no such thing as a bad kid. Right. Um, Thank you, Jordan Peterson. Right. <laughs> <laughs> or he'll, he'll often say, you know, you're, I'm a good person. You're not a good person, he'll say, you know? He will say that. <laughs> uh, I think he advocates hitting kids, though. Right. 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 So. I read that in his book recently. I was surprised. Really? I was surprised. He, he, he do, certainly says to use the, use it not it at all. Um, but if you, once, it, once it's in the, in the toolbox, um, you, you often think it's going to be the first thing a lot of people go to. So, right. Yeah. Here's how his uh, children grew up. I think it's his daughter who's into like a meat only diet or something like that. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. He's but, an eccentric dude. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I would say again that um, in terms of violence, a lot of it's committed by the mothers. Uh, you know, so if you want a society dominated by women, 
we already have it, right? A majority of our upbringing, especially for males, is dominated by women, not just in public schools, but in their lives, um, growing up. And most of the physical punishment is dealt, given out by women. Uh, and it's been my experience, so, and it seems to match a lot of the findings and statistics for these sort of things as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I would say in terms for Mark Hamill, uh, <laughs> lay off the soy. Uh, maybe that's, I don't know, maybe that, that creature that he kind of guzzles that milk from is like a soy creature of some sort. I think the one that, was, that he used to keep warm and Well, no, no the one that he just kind of this like milks right in front of that girl, uh, Ray. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's like, what are you doing? He's got like soy milk all over his face, like mm, refreshing. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it could be on that planet that they produce soy milk. Right? Yeah. Yeah. That's like... <laughs> Whatever you got. I think it's great as a Joker. I think uh, it's good that they brought him back to Star Wars. Sure. Um, I think the, the way that they cut him off was horrible. Uh, I, I like that he's vocal about how we didn't like how the Star Wars series was turning out. Yeah. Uh, but I think other than that, I think a lot of this stuff he's just kind of shut up about <laughs> Right. Is he going to say? Is, I think he would be on the camp that would say that uh, Han didn't shoot first, right? Because hmm. he's anti-gun, right? So, he uh, would, yes, that's right? a good point. I, I think he would say Han did not shoot first. I think he would uh, back the uh, re-editing of it just so that the uh, Greco assassin guy, bounty hunter, is shooting first, and now Han can shoot back. When, of course, I mean, come on, this, there's already a threat of your life right there. You got a point, gun pointed at you, right? Right. Right. Yeah. It, of course, in the movies, it's always um, you're pointing your guns at each other for like five minutes before somebody right. makes oh, the move. I'm going to wait until you try to shoot him. Yeah. <laughs> I like uh, the solo movie was really good. And that uh, Woody Harrelson. Uh, have you seen that movie yet? I have not seen that one yet. So there's a scene where Woody Harrelson is. Uh, he does his talk, as villains generally do. He's going to do his talk, but Han Solo just shoots him. <laughs> 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 well, it's like the uh, the Harrison Ford in um, Indiana Jones, where the guys come right. in with the big saber. Right, like, and he's like, I don't have... just Done. pulls out the revolver. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Yes. <laughs> but uh, I think this is a good place to wrap up our first podcast. Yeah, uh, I think it was a good one. Yeah, I think so too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys for watching uh, and listening, and this will be up on iTunes and on YouTube. Uh, this is Cal Molinay. John Kennedy. Stay liberated. Mm -hmm.